better. So thank you, Victor, and thank you, Shelley, and thank you to the Transcendentalism Council for uh, having me join them this evening. So if I'm a, uh, a, uh, a Unitarian now, where do I sign off like Mr. Thorough? So, but anyway, thank you so much. So this is the anniversary of Thomas Wentworth Higginson's 200th birthday. This month is actually his 199th birthday. So we're starting off the year of Higginson, as I like to call it, uh, with this program tonight. And hopefully next year we'll be able to have a big party with cake and all kinds of good things for it. So I'm going to do uh, my lecture. And then certainly by the time I'm done, we'll be able to have some Q&A about Mr. Higginson or anything else that you hear in my paper. So let's begin. Thomas Wentworth Higginson was a Unitarian minister, writer, transcendentalist, feminist, editor, and radical abolitionist. He served the first religious society in Newburyport until they dismissed him for being too radical. He helped convene the Worcester Women's Rights Convention in 1850 and ran that same year for Congress on the free soil ticket, which he lost. He was involved with two famous fugitive slave cases in Massachusetts, Thomas Sims in 1851 and Anthony Burns in 1854, and was one of the so-called Secret Six who helped raise money for John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry in 1859. He led an all-Black regiment of freed slaves in the Civil War and worked to integrate the New Newport, Rhode Island public schools. He was a regular contributor to the Atlantic Monthly for 30 years, and in 1884, he wrote the first biography of Margaret Fuller. Higginson lived into the 20th century, dying at the age of 87 on May 11, 1911. Born into a world not much different from the one his grandfather experienced in the 18th century, by the time Wentworth passed, he'd seen steamships, railroads, and the telegraph invented, and a few years before his death, he saw the city of Boston switching over from gas to electric lighting, while Higginson himself started using a typewriter and even rode in an automobile. Throughout his long life, Higginson seemed to know everyone worth knowing, from radicals to literary stars to politicians, from Lucy Stone to Charles Sumner to Charles Darwin. Uh, he even started a young socialist club in the early 20th century with Sinclair Lewis and Jack London. Today, he's best remembered as the man who discovered Emily Dickinson, but he was best acquainted with and influenced by the writers and philosophers that lived in Concord, Massachusetts. He would write late in life, quote, few of us now remain who were baptized into the light and hope of the transcendental movement. To that and to the anti-slavery movement, I always feel that I owe most of what makes life worth living. Thomas Wentworth Higginson was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts on December 22nd, 1823, the youngest of 10 children. His childhood, it was reported, was privileged and comfortable. But by the time he was 10, when his father died, the family hit hard times and his mother, Louisa, was left alone with Great Wentworth and his siblings. He and his mother would remain particularly close until her death in 1864. In later years, he would remember his mother as the one person who influenced him the most throughout his life. Just before 6 a.m. on August 26, 1837, young Wentworth, as he was told by his friends and family, arrived at the Harvard College University Hall. Over the next two days, he and other college hopefuls would take the entrance exams to see if they would become a Harvard freshman. Higginson, like most of the boys who were taking the exams, was young. He was three months shy of his 14th birthday. At the end of the two days, Harvard's president, Josiah Quincy, formally announced that Higginson had passed. Higginson made the announcement himself in his journal that he wore my coat for the first time. The coat was the required black coat with black buttons that all Harvard boys were expected to wear on Sundays and for public processions. Some of you would remember that uh, about that time, Henry Farrow got in trouble at Harvard because he did not have a black coat and he wore a green one. Higginson would be a good student, but to save money, he lived at home with his mother in Cambridge rather than live in the dorms. 
This made it hard for him to make friends with his classmates. He did become friends with his Greek tutor, Jones Vary, and his Latin tutor was the Harvard professor of modern languages, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Higginson was a conscientious student, and he rose at 5 a.m. every day to drill himself in Greek, Latin, mathematics, and history. He finished eighth in his class freshman year, and in the class of 1841, he graduated second out of 45 boys. But even though he was a good student, he was not fond of another Harvard requirement, attending chapel services. In fact, he became notorious for always falling asleep in chapel. And he felt no shame about it, noting in his journal that he, quote, snoozed through it all comfortably. Still, this disinterest in church services did not mean that Higginson was irreligious. After his graduation in 1841, he went on to attend the Harvard Divinity School. Richard, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. This dissatisfaction gave rise to a more liberal, independent-minded Unitarian clergy and ministers like William Ellery Channing, not the poet, his uncle, James Freeman Clark, Theodore Parker, and Ralph Waldo Emerson were soon being called a new name to describe their mystical, progressive spirituality, transcendentalists. The newly ordained 21-year-old Wentworth Higginson quickly fell under the spell of the Transcendentalists. In fact, it was his reading of Emerson that directly led to his decision to join the ministry. On September 15, 1847, Thomas Wentworth Higginson was ordained as the minister of the First Religious Society of Newburyport, Massachusetts. This would be his first pastorate. While the First Religious Society was a Unitarian church, it was far from radical. In fact, many of the members were quite concerned about Higginson's ordination. He openly espoused the teachings of Theodore Parker, and like Parker, seemed to be not only a transcendentalist, but an abolitionist as well. Still, the church had been without a minister for some time, and one was desperately needed, even a radical one like Higginson. For his part, Higginson wanted his ordination to be memorable. He invited William Henry Channing, one of the most radical Unitarian ministers in the country, to deliver the ordination sermon. Channing was a bold choice. In some ways, he was even more radical and controversial than Theodore Parker. And Ralph Waldo Emerson called him, quote, the evil times lone patriot. But others found Channing to be the most extreme embodiment among the church reformers of the misty, ill-defined transcendentalism. The Reverend James Freeman Clark, another member of the so-called Transcendental Club, also spoke at the ordination. He urged Higginson to always speak the truth, regardless of who is offended by that honesty. Quote, you cannot please everybody, perhaps not anybody. Still, you may please your own conscience and God. The next day, the Newburyport Herald would report on the new minister's ordination. Quote, Mr. Higginson is a young man of much intellect and moral power. He seems tinctured with those radical and imaginative notions which would fain seek to govern society at large more wisely than God has seen fit to guide it ever since the dawn of creation. Higginson would last barely three years at the church. In the end, he was indeed too radical for the Newburyport community, and it was his abolitionism that ultimately brought about his reg resignation. As one of the congregation would later say, Higginson was, quote, too much of a reformer. In 1852, Higginson would become the pastor of the more radical and welcoming Free Church of Worcester, Massachusetts, and he would hold that position until 1858. 
From the very beginning of his career, it was evident that he was going to model his ministry on those of Emerson and Parker. And over time, he would become friends with both of them. It's safe to say that in a literary sense, Emerson had the biggest influence on Higginson's writing. He considered Waldo to be the man of letters, the most influential writer of their era. The two men would socialize when Emerson lectured in Worcester or when Higginson would lecture in Concord. In fact, he would often stay at Emerson's house when he was here in town. As Higginson would later remember, quote, it was a delight to be in his study, to finger his few and well-read books, a discipline of humility to have one's modest portmanteau carried upstairs by Plato himself, a joy to see him relapsed into a happy grandparent holding a baby on his knee and wave his playful finger above the little clutching hand saying joyously, this boy is a little philosopher. He philosophizes about everything. It is well known that Emerson often invited his guests into his study, a room that most visitors considered sacred and special. It was Emerson's sanctum sanctorum. But on a visit to the study in 1850, when Emerson was not around, Higginson took some liberties that few would dare. He wrote to Emerson, during your absence, I made a visit to your study, which I would gladly have had a visit to yourself likewise. I saw several things which I took, and the first edition of Tennyson was a special attempt. I had pleasant memories of it and had long wished to meet it again. Emboldened perhaps by Ellery's daring yes. spirit, I borrowed it, promising myself to return it in a few weeks. Alas, that the conscience should be so hardened by time, but I've kept it six weeks and do not feel so guilty as when I first pocketed it. Perhaps the same influence may have softened your surprise at such gypsy, gypsy habits, and you may accept my thanks as some equivalent. And I'm not really sure from that letter if Higginson actually returned the book or not. Higginson never got over his admiration of Emerson. The following is from his 1899 book, Contemporaries, and it pretty much sums up his high opinion of the Sage of Concord. Quote, Emerson's permanent standing among thinkers, his influence as a stimulus was quite unequal during the era. No one has reverenced the divine art of speech more than Emerson or practiced it more nobly. Yet it may be fearlessly said that within the limits of a single sentence, no man who ever wrote the English tongue has put more meaning into words than Emerson. In his hands, to adopt Ben Johnson's phrase, words are rammed with thought. No one has reverenced the divine art of speech more than Emerson or practiced it more nobly. The Greeks, he once said in an unpublished lecture, anticipated by their very language what the best orator would say, and neither Greek precision nor Roman vigor could produce a phrase that Emerson could not match. On August 9, 1854, Henry David Thoreau's book, second book, Walden, or Life in the Woods, was published by Tickner and Fields of Boston. A few days later, Reverend Thomas Wentworth Higginson of Newburyport would write to Thoreau, Dear Sir, let me thank you heartily for your paper on the present condition of Massachusetts, read at Framingham and printed in the Liberator. That was Thoreau's slavery in Massachusetts lecture. As a literary statement of the truth, which every day is making more manifest, it surpasses everything else which the terrible week in Boston has called out. I need hardly add my thanks for Walden, which I have been awaiting for so many years. Through Mr. Field's kindness, I have read a great deal of it in sheets. Higginson had been aware of Thoreau for a few years and one, was one of the few to purchase a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers when it was published in 1849. He would call the book One Among the Scriptures, and he told Thoreau that he had no doubt that Walden would have a larger circulation than a week, but not a more select or appreciative audience than him. In 1849, Higginson came to Concord and met Thoreau. He would note in his journal, 
In Concord, I went to see Thoreau. He is more humane and polite than I suppose. He makes lead pencils with his father on Monday and Tuesday, and on the other days he surveys land, both, mathematic both mathematically and meditatively. He lays out house lots in Haverhill and in the moon. He talks sententiously and originally. I find nobody who enjoys a week on the Concord River as I do, but this I did not tell him. Along with Thoreau, Higginson would also become well acquainted with Bronson Alkin. And I find the following description to be a great little snapshot into both men's personalities. Higginson would write, to Worcester came also Alkid and Thoreau from time to time, the former to give those mystic monologues which he called conversations and which were liable to be disturbed and even checked when any other participant offered anything but meek interrogations. Thoreau came to take walks in the woods or perhaps to Wachusett with Harrison Blake and with Theo Brown, the freshest and most original mind in Worcester. Sometimes I joined the party and found Thoreau a dry humorist and also a good walker, while Alcott, although he too walked, usually steered for a convenient log at the edge of the first grove and seating himself there, conversed once more. Higginson also couldn't help but compare Alcott with Emerson. Mr. Alcott and Mr. Emerson were singularly different in temperament and yet singularly united. They were alike in simplicity and integrity of nature, as well as in other, as well as in their chosen place of residence and in the elevated influence they exercise. In all other respects, they were unalike. Mr. Alcott was what may be called the self-made man in literature, whereas Mr. Emerson came out of what was called Brahmin blood, had behind him a line of educated clergymen and had received the best that could be given in the way of training by the New England of his youth. Their temperaments were in many ways different. Emerson was shy and reserved. Alcott was effusive and cordial. Emerson repressed personal adulation. Alcott expanded under it. Emerson's style was enriched by varied knowledge, his use of which made one always wish for more. Alcott's reading lay only in one or two directions, and his use of it was sometimes fatiguing. Emerson was thrifty and a good steward of his own affairs. Alcott always seemed in a stately way penniless. Emerson's most startling early paradoxes were given with such dignity that those hearers most hilariously disposed were subdued to gravity. Alcott's most thoughtful sentences sometimes came with such a flavor and needless whimsical, whimsicality as to make even the faithful smile. Yet so sincere was their mutual admiration, so noble their love for each other, that it is impossible to speak of it with anything but reverence. Living in Worcester, Higginson was often present when Thoreau was in the city. And two of Thoreau's earliest followers, H.G.O. Blake and Theo Brown, were also well acquainted with Higginson. All three men were often invited, all three men often invited Thoreau to visit Worcester, and sometimes they even got him to lecture there. And while the three of them were convinced of Thoreau's genius, others were not so sure. Here's Higginson's description of Thoreau giving his Life in the Woods lecture in Boston in 1852. And needless, needless to say, it did not go well. The scene of the lecture was to be a small hall in a court opening from Tremont Street opposite King's Chapel. The hall itself being leased by an association of young mechanics who had a reading room opening out of it. The appointed day ushered in a furious snowstorm before which the janitor of the building retreated in despair, leaving the court almost blockaded. When Thoreau and I plowed through, we found a few young mechanics reading newspapers. And when the appointed hour came, there were assembled only Mr. Alcott, Dr. Walter Channing, the father of Ellery Channing, and at most three or four ticket holders. No one wished to postpone the affair, 
And Mr. Alcott suggested that the thing to be done was to adjourn to the reading room where he doubted not the young men would be grateful for the new gospel that Thoreau offered, for which he himself undertook to prepare their minds. I can see Alcott now going from one to another or collecting them in little groups and expounding to them with his lofty Socratic mean the privileges they were about to share. This is his life. This is his book. He is to print it presently. I think we shall all be glad, shall we not, either to read his book or to hear it? Some laid down their newspapers, more retained them. The lecture proved to be one of the most introspective chapters from Walden. A few went to sleep, the rest rustled their papers, and the most vivid impression which I retain, retain from the whole enterprise is the profound gratitude I felt to Dr. Walter Channing, who forced upon me a $5 bill towards the expenses of the disastrous entertainment. Higginson read and reread both of the books published in Thoreau's lifetime, and in his letters to friends and acquaintances, he would do his best to spread the word about the conquered hermit. We see, we see how few people live in nature by the rarity of any real glimpse of it in their books. Almost all is secondhand and vague. The only thoroughly outdoor book I've ever seen is Thoreau's Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which is fascinating beyond compare to anyone who knows nature, though the religion and philosophy are of the wildest. He has led a strange Indian life, the author, and his errors and extremes are on the opposite from most people's. And he would say about Walden, Thoreau has sent me his book, which I have enjoyed as much, I think, as the other. It is calmer and more whole, crammed with fine observation and thought, and rising into sublimity at last. It's obvious that, unlike many of their contemporaries, Higginson seemed to understand Thoreau, and he appreciated him, when, appreciated him when few people outside of New England even knew who Thoreau was. He championed Thoreau's writings while he was alive, and he continued to write about him after Thoreau's death in 1862. In 1879, Higginson wrote a book called Short Studies of American Authors, and his appreciation of Thoreau sounds not unlike some modern day Thoreauvians. Thoreau died at 44 without having achieved fame or fortune. It is common to speak of his life as a failure, but to me it seems with all its drawbacks to have been a great and eminent success. Even testing it only by the common appetite of authors for immortality, his seems already a sure and enviable place. Time is rapidly melting away the dross from his writings and exhibiting their gold. But his standard was higher than the mere desire for fame, and he has told it plainly, quote, if the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy, and life emits a fragrance like flowers and sweet-scented herbs, is more elastic, starry, and immortal, that is your success. Higginson was a fan of Nathaniel Hawthorne's writings, but for all the time that he spent in Concord with the other writers, he never became very well acquainted with Hawthorne. This is not surprising. Even after he moved back to Concord in 1860, Hawthorne was known as a recluse, and he rarely spent much time with Emerson, Thoreau, or Alcott. Still, this lack of intimacy with Hawthorne, the man, did not damper Higginson's enthusiasm for Hawthorne, the writer. He would write, I only saw him twice and never spoke to him. I first met him on a summer morning in Concord as he was walking along the road near the old manse with his wife by his side and a noble looking baby boy in a little wagon which his father was pushing. I remember him as tall, firm, and strong in bearing. His wife looked pensive and dreamy as she, was in, as she indeed was then and always. The child was Julian, then known among the neighbors as the Prince. When I passed Hawthorne, he lifted upon me his great gray eyes with a look too keen to seem indifferent, too shy to be sympathetic, and that was all. 
but it comes back to memory like the one glimpse of Shelley, which Browning describes, and which he likens to the day when he found an eagle's feather. Again, I met Hawthorne at one of the sessions of a short-lived literary club in Boston, and I recall the imper imperturbable, imperturbable dignity and patience with which he sat through a vexatious discussion whose details seemed as much dwarfed by his presence as if he had been a statue of Olympian Zeus. After Hawthorne's death in 1864, Higginson would have what he called a brief but intimate relationship with Sophia Hawthorne, even visiting the wayside when in Concord and spending some nights there. I find the following passage to be a wonderful glimpse into Hawthorne's life as a writer as he struggled with what is undeniably his greatest novel. This comes from a story that Sophia told Higginson. But during the whole winter when the Scarlet Letter was being written, he seemed depressed and anxious. There was a knot in his forehead all the time, Mrs. Hawthorne said, but she thought it was from some pecuniary anxiety, such as sometimes affected that small household. One evening he came to her and said that he had written something which he wished to read aloud. It was worth very little, but as it was finished, he might as well read it. He read aloud all that evening, but as the romance was left unfinished when they went to bed, not a word was said about it on the other side. He always disliked, she said, to have anything criticized until the whole thing had been heard. He read a second evening, and the concentrated excitement had grown so great that she could scarcely bear it. At last it grew unendurable, and in the midst of the scene near the end of the book, where Arthur Dimsdale meets Hester and her child in the forest, Mrs. Hawthorne sank from her low stool upon the floor, pressed her hands upon her ears, and said that she could hear no more. Hawthorne put down the manuscript and looked at her in perfect amazement. Do you real, really feel it so much, he said? Then there must be something in it. In 1867, Nuna Hawthorne was engaged to Starro Higginson, a nephew of Thomas Wentworth Higginson, but for reasons that are unclear, the engagement was broken off. We know that Starro himself told Nuna that, quote, he didn't believe in marriage, so that probably had something to do with it. After the engagement was ended, Wentworth Higginson became something of an uncle to Nuna, and they were close for a short time. He would describe her on a visit to the wayside. Una's face and eyes, eyes were what I expected, but her figure and port were nobler than I expected, and her magnificent hair blazed and glittered upon me in the doorway most unexpectedly. She was sweet and confiding as possible and perfectly free, and it was as if I had known her from the cradle. This was just as I expected. We were very happy together for a time in the little plain parlor, too plain almost for comfort. But Una did not really seem to need anything more. There was something so rare about her. And when the pretty little wayward spoiled rose came in with another gorgeous head and with that exquisite beauty of complexion which Una wanted, it seemed as much ornament as the little room could bear. Higginson would maintain friendships with all of the conquered writers and their families until their deaths. Needless to say, he outlived them all, and by the end of his life, he was the only living connection to what he called the sunny side of the transcendental period. He even wrote an article for the Atlantic with that title in 1904, in which he looked back on the radicals and eccentrics that had been his friends. How strange it must have been for him writing at the dawn of a new century about, in some cases, long dead men and women who had been such a tremendous influence in his life and his career. Yet he knew that it was an era the likes of which would never be seen again. Quote, it required time and a concentrated influence to constitute a literary group in America. The geographical headquarters of this particular group was Boston of which Cambridge and Concord may, may be regarded for this purpose as suburbs. Such a circle of authors as Emerson, 
Hawthorne, Longfellow, Lowell, Whittier, Alcott, Thoreau, Parkman, and others had never before met in America. And now that they have passed away, no such local group anywhere remains. Nor has the most marked individual genius elsewhere, such as, for instance, that of Poe or Whitman, been the center of so conspicuous a combination. The best literary representative of this group of men in bulk was undoubtedly the Atlantic Monthly, to which almost every one of them contributed, and of which they made up the substantial opening strength. But Thomas Wentworth Higginson's writings and observations did more than just keep the names of the conquered literati alive. It put flesh and bone on these people and made them come alive, foibles and all. Through his essays and books, he shared the remarkable lives of his friends. He wrote about them with a love and admiration that few could. And by reading his observations, we get not only a better idea of what Emerson, Thoreau, and the others were like, but we get a pretty good look at Thomas Wentworth Higginson himself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, I am looking to see in the chat if there are any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, but because of our, our uh, not being able to run this as a webinar, because somebody had sort of uh, preempted our webinar slot, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a meeting. Uh, it's not a webinar, and that means that uh, participants can unmute themselves and speak in, in real time. Absolutely. So, Free, uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions the old fashioned way, uh, please uh, look down at the bottom of your screen where you're going to see a little microphone icon that says mute. If there is a red line through your microphone, then click it so the red line goes away, and then you'll be able to ask Richard a question, but uh, identify yourself as you do. So, one thing I would like to add so Higginson wait, wrote way more than any of these other people. <laughs> he wrote for, you know, until almost to the day that he died in 1911. He wrote a lot of good things, but to be fair, he was never on the level of an Emerson or a Thoreau or any of these other people that he admired. He was a good writer, but he wasn't a great writer. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's been pretty much forgotten over the years is he just doesn't stand on the same level. <laughs> as all of these people who we admired so much. I like his writings. Um, I like his poetry, but he would go through phases. You know, at times he wanted to be Emerson. And so he would write, <laughs> he would write, you know, uh, philosophical things. At other times he wanted to be thorough and he would write about flowers and birds. So he was never really sure exactly what he wanted to do. I think his best writing is actually the stuff that he wrote when he's talking about his friendships with all these people. And uh, as, a, as a literary critic, I think it's, it's, it, that's some of his best writing. So I have a question. Um, I don't know, I guess you can't see me, but this is Jackie. Um, hi. hi. So I was surprised that you skated over a little bit um, how much you love um, Higginson and him being part of the Secret Six. So um, can you talk about that? Sure, absolutely. So as a minister, much like Theodore Parker, um, Higginson thought it was his duty as a minister to really be involved with the reform movements of the day. And he, he was a women's rights activist um, throughout his life. But in the years before the Civil War, the anti-slavery movement was really what got him more excited and, and, and uh, really got him more involved. And he didn't wanna just be some minister who preaches every Sunday. He wanted to be an activist minister who would actually go out and try to do something. So he was involved in trying to free Anthony Burns in 1854. Um, he was actually one of the guys to lead the riot at the uh, Boston courthouse when Burns was being held captive. And uh, he got cut on the chin with a saber. <laughs> so he's really 
Southern Adventist there. He's, he's not only preaching against the slavery, he's raising money. By the time things were happening in Kansas uh, in the mid 1850s, he was sending money and guns to Kansas. He actually went to Kansas uh, to see how things were going firsthand, and he was involved in some underground railroad activities there. So when John Brown started to come to New England to lecture and to raise money for what became Harper's Ferry, the raid on Harper's Ferry, one of the first people that Frank Sanborn sent him to was Thomas Wentworth Higginson, because he knew that Higginson was the guy who would kind of walk the walk and talk the talk. Did that answer your question, Jackie? I think Jackie is muted. Okay. So yeah, so he was he was a guy who didn't want to just sit on the sidelines. He wanted to make sure that things got done and, and oh and, sorry, <laughs> I was muted. So that does answer my question. And uh can I ask another question if I want to see if anybody else has questions first, but I know I have another question. Go ahead, Jackie, we're here. Um, so uh, can you also talk about what happened with Margaret Fuller um, and uh, Channing uh, and and Mary Chan, who who had who was Higginson married to? I don't know if you talked about that, so. Higginson was married to Ellery Channing's sister. <laughs> um, and so the Higginsons and Fullers all kind of knew each other when they were growing up in Cambridge together. Um, and so Higginson married um, Mary Channing, Ellery Channing's sister. And um, Ellery, of course, was married to Margaret Fuller's sister, Ellen. Um, and so they were all, they all kind of knew each other. They all kind of hung out together um, because they were all related. Um, Higginson, like the other writers, like Emerson and Farrow and, and, and Alcott and Hawthorne, he liked Ellery, but because he was related to him through marriage, he was a little bit more skeptical of Ellery as a poet and as a writer. And then, of course, Ellery and Ellen were having marital issues. And when she decided to leave Ellery, it was uh, Higginson who drove for, came up from Worcester to Concord and took her and the Channing kids back to Worcester. And they lived with him, with him and his wife for a, a couple of years until Ellery and, and Ellen got back together. But, they met, but because of that, because Higginson came and got her, um, Ellery and Higginson had a big falling out and they were never really close after that. Um, Ellery kind of snubbed him for the rest of his life. So did Higginson actually know, meet Thoreau before the, the exchange of letters where Thoreau was sent down to, to New York to look for the remains of I'm not sure I'm not sure how much Hig I'm not sure how much Higginson was involved with Thoreau going down to look for Margaret's remains. Um, oh it was he, just Emerson, okay. Emerson was the one that sent him down. Okay, but, thank you. Sure. Can I ask a question uh, on uh, connected to your mention of Margaret Fuller? Uh, Higginson wrote uh, you said the first biography of Margaret Fuller. Right, and, the first and, uh, um, I'm, I'm wondering how that biography was received. I sort of have the impression that uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, Margaret Fuller was still kind of a celebrity, uh, although in the 20th century, uh, people seem to have forgotten about her until, uh, until her bicentennial a few years ago. Right, well, right after she died, um, Emerson and William Henry Channing and I forget who else, they put together um, a, a book called Memories of Margaret Fuller, but it wasn't, 
it was more of, of some of her writings and their, their remembrances of her rather than a full-fledged biography. So wasn't um, James Freeman Clark the other editor of yeah, that? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, Sandy just said, and James Freeman Clark. <laughs> so um Higginson, he felt particularly close to Margaret. Uh, you know, they were friends and acquaintances. I'm still not convinced how close they really were, but he decided to write the first the first full-length biography. And it was actually part of a series of books called Men, I think it was called Men of Letters. And Margaret was was the only woman in this Men of Letters series. <laughs> so that kind of shows how how important she was at the time. So 1884, I think she was still very much um, a celebrity who people were remembering. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Richard, uh, Brian Bartlett speaking here. Uh, oh, I noticed, yeah, I noticed in Wikipedia that there are three, by at least three biographies listed. One by Tilden Edelstein, one by Howard N. Mayer, and one by Anna May Wells, Ma Anna Mary Wells. Have you, uh, are you familiar with any of those? And if so, would you recommend one of them in particular? The biographies of Higginson? Yeah. You know what? I haven't read any of those. The one that I, the one that I have that I've read um, is by his second wife. Um, uh, and okay. Was published not too long after after he passed. Um, another good biography that I like. It's called White Heat. Um, uh, yes, yeah. That's the one that I enjoy the best. Um, it's White that's Heat. That's particularly about him and Dickinson, though, right? It's it uh, is, but I like it because it really goes into really pretty good detail about his life before he met Emily and her life as well. So it's kind of like a dual biography in a lot of ways. Um, so I enjoy that, I enjoy that one a lot. Um, yeah. But the one by Mary Thatcher Higginson um, is the one that, that I also enjoy because she was married to him. So she, yeah. she I feel like she knew him better than anybody else. Yeah, he had such a fascinating life that I'm looking forward to reading. I noticed a couple of the more recent ones are hefty 300, 400 page biographies. So. Well, that's uh, you know that's the thing. He lived such a long life, and he outlived right. people. Yeah. So, and you know, and every time, <laughs> every time I'm reading about somebody from the 19th century, I, my first thing thought is, gee, I wonder if Higginson met him. And almost all the time, he always did. <laughs> you know, he went he went to England, and he he spent time um, uh, with uh, with Darwin. Uh, you know, just people like that. Every time you read about him meeting somebody, it always blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This was a great uh, in incentive to uh, find out a lot more about him. I'm Thanks, grateful. Brian. I'm glad you joined. I'm glad you joined us. I think, I think somebody asked a question about about Higginson and Emily Dickinson. Anybody want to claim that one? I don't see it in the chat. Well, I'm willing to bring that up. That's kind of always the elephant in the room when you're talking about, about Higginson. <laughs> um, you know, by the time, so, so he wrote an article called Let, uh, Letters to a Young Contributor. And it was basically an article in the Atlantic Monthly about how young writers can get themselves published. And so um, by the time that it was published, he was actually off to the Civil War. This young, not so young, this 30-something this poet out in Amherst named Emily Dickinson obviously read this article and wrote to, Dig uh, wrote to Higginson asking him if he could look at some of her poetry. And uh, that was in 1862. And that started a, a, a relationship of sorts that they had until she died. But they, they only they only met twice though, and they, they, and they corresponded for something. How many years before they met? Well, let's see. When did when did Emily die? What year was that? Um, did she die in 
like 1880, 18, somewhere 1885 or something like that. So they, over 25 years, they corresponded with each other. Yeah, but I think so, it wasn't like eight years before they actually met face to face. Yeah, they met, I think it was 1870 when they first met, 71. Um, and he wrote a really great article about it in later years for the Atlantic. Um, one of my one of my favorite stories is that you know he would show his first wife um, he would show her these letters and she said why why do the insane always cling to you? It's <laughs> <laughs> such a great line. <laughs> um, but uh, he obviously saw something in a, in her poetry uh, because he he would send her suggestions and and they remained pretty close even when she, he wouldn't write back for a while she would write to him especially during the war asking him if he was okay and, and things like that so i think there was definitely a closeness there between the two of them he attended her funeral um and did a reading um and it was one of the few non-family members to actually go to her funeral when she died well thank you Oh, um, and I, I I appreciate your uh, flexibility with our technical difficulties and uh, uh, your uh, uh, insights and your answers to your questions. Uh, so thank you, Richard. Thanks to all of you uh, for joining us this evening and for your patience. Uh, and uh, we uh, wish you and your loved ones happiness as you celebrate your favorite midwinter holiday whatever that may be yes thank you to everyone for tuning in and thank you to victor and shelley and the transcendentalism council it's been a pleasure see you later thank you